Thanks very much for having me here. It's a pleasure being back in Frankfurt. It's been a while. Uh, this time I've been biking around. That made me very happy uh, as a Dutch person. I like to bike even in New York. Um, and now I'm in Frankfurt. All right. I will start with a bit of, of background of what my lab is interested in. And then for, for most of the talk today, I'll focus on specifically on the beta rhythm. That's our, our, our latest favorite rhythm, I guess. Um, but my lab in general studies brain oscillations. And, and the question we're interested in is, is perhaps a fairly basic one that's been around for, for well, a good century at this point. It's really the question of what are these brain rhythms? What are these oscillations that are so prominent when we record from the brain? Um, as, as I imagine you're well aware, those were some of the first recordings uh, made from the human brain by, by Hans Berger. Those were the first observations, this 10 hertz alpha rhythm that appeared to be modulated when opening and, and closing your eyes. Uh, around the same time, uh, Bishop was doing recordings in the optical tract of, of the rabbit and observed a cyclic variation of cortical excitability. So these ideas and these observations have been around for, for a good century. Uh, we know that uh, brain rhythms are well preserved across species, across brains of different sizes, and they can be observed at various uh, time scales. However, what these rhythms really do is, is to a large degree still an unanswered question or at the very least highly, highly debated in the field. And the focus of my lab is very much this question of what is the role of brain uh, oscillations. Um, <clears throat> I like to think of, of the original or traditional approach of, of looking at brain oscillations as basically mapping oscillations onto typically cognitive or, or, or perceptual functions. And at this point, you can do a PubMed or a Google Scholar search and pretty much find a link between any, any, any rhythm under the sun and any, any sort of cognitive or perceptual process of interest. So while I think this, this has been a helpful initial approach, obviously now that doesn't really allow us to understand what these, these rhythms are doing if you can link everything to, uh, to every possible function. So the approach we and, and, and of course many others in the field are taking currently is trying to map these rhythms onto lower level operations. I, I like to think of these as sort of building blocks. Um, yesterday, uh, David used the term primitives. I think that sort of the task for us as a field interested in brain rhythms is to understand what these lower level operations might be that we think these brain rhythms implement. And then the logic here is that these lower level operations are recruited by various higher level uh, functions that we've labeled as various cognitive processes that would then also explain why you can pretty much uh, link any rhythm to any higher level. Uh, uh, function. So, so the task I see for us is to understand what these lower level operations are. Now, today I'll mainly talk about beta and what we think beta is implementing. I just a sort of a disclaimer before I start. I want to say that we don't claim to have figured this out. It's very possible that what we consider low level operations not quite the right level yet, or that our working hypothesis might not be uh, exactly right. But I, I do believe in this approach, and I think by refining uh, uh, this basically the understanding of this level will ultimately allow us to understand what brain rhythms do. So we study this in, in various species and with, with different techniques in my lab. Uh, we're doing <clears throat> animal recordings in rodents and, and, and in collaboration with other labs also in, in non-human primates where we can record from single unit cells and, and as well as from local populations. At Columbia we can do intracranial recordings in certain uh, patient populations. And then a lot of our work is uh, non-invasive and healthy human participants using MEG and EEG. At all of these levels, uh, we find it very important to link whatever brain dynamics we're observing back to behavior so that whatever we observe and think is interesting in the brain, we can also link back to something that's actually happening in, in the outside world that might be relevant for the organism at hand. Um, and then in, in collaboration with, with uh, other colleagues, we're also working on some uh, modeling, trying to tie all of this together. 
all right. So as I said, we have these ideas about what sort of operations or, or building blocks uh, these various rhythms um, might implement. A lot of my previous and actually also ongoing work has been on the alpha rhythm, where we think, uh, which we think plays a role in, in functional inhibition. I will probably mention some alpha today. It's hard to, to not talk about it, but for the uh, majority of my talk, I'll focus on the beta rhythm, which um, we have proposed plays an important role in the formation of flexible ensembles. And I'll talk more about what we mean with that. I'm first going to travel back in time a bit to my PhD, where we did this um, uh, study in monkeys that was kind of the, the provided the foundation for this, this our, our um, um, beta framework. The work here is um, in monkeys performing a tactile discrimination task and we're recording in various areas of the somatosensory and, and motor network. And what the animal has to do is perceive a uh, tactile vibrating stimulus with a particular frequency, hold that frequency in, in working memory for uh, up to a few seconds, and then compare this to a second uh, vibrating uh, stimulus with a different frequency and indicate whether the second frequency is higher or lower than the first. We, we actually were very much interested in the alpha rhythm for this particular paradigm. I won't talk about that today, but one kind of uh, surprising observation that just popped out of the, the data there was also this beta modulation that we saw um, both during the towards the end of the working memory retention interval and towards the end of the decision delay prior to the animal reporting uh, the, 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 their decision. Again, we didn't really have any particular prediction here for beta. It's just kind of just a uh, uh, surprising finding. We, for a while, we didn't quite understand what was going on. But what turned out to be the case when we sorted the trials based on the decision the animal had to make, so comparing the second frequency uh, with the first, when we sorted the trials based on the difference between those two uh, stimuli, the trials sort of separated into a, a group of trials where F2 was of higher frequency than F1, and that those trials happen to have higher beta power in this sort of burst here towards the end. And for the trials where F2 was of lower frequency than F1, for some reason, beta power was lower. Now, we didn't quite understand why beta power might be modulated there um, in this particular way, but it was clearly very much um, providing as a readout of the animal's decision, because when we looked at incorrect trials, the the pattern flip, meaning that we could look at beta power and uh, predict what the animal was going to answer, including on incorrect trials. So this is not a reflection of the actual uh, uh, physical properties of the stimulus, but of the, the animal's uh, report. Now, we're recording in the somatosensory and motor system, so you might think, well, this is just motor preparation, the animal's preparing for, for a button press. Um, However, we, we had a control condition where the animal made the same motor response, but didn't have to do this, uh, the actual comparison between stimuli. And there we could not, um, we did not have a readout of which button the animal was going to press uh, based on beta powers. At the very least, some component of this beta modulation uh, reflects the decision outcome uh, beyond pure motor mapping. All right, so this was a somatosensory task. Of course, beta is most well known, at least, at least historically, as a, a somatomotor rhythm. So we wanted to make sure this wasn't something particular about using a tactile paradigm. So we later looked at the same uh, uh, phenomenon in a cross-modal discrimination task that included an auditory condition. Again, we could use beta as a readout during the decision uh, delay as to which um, report the animal was going to make. Now you might appreciate here we have, in this particular experiment, we had two monkeys. Uh, they both showed his effect, but the, the, the pattern is flipped. So there might not be a direct one-to-one -one mapping of beta power to the decision outcome as to lower or higher across the board. It might depend on the, on the animal here, but regardless, in each case, we could use this signal to, to read out the animal's decision 
And then in a different version of the task, that was a categorization task where the animal didn't have to wait for the second stimulus in order to arrive at a decision, we had this readout from basically the right after the first stimulus. So again, it really reflects the decision outcome. We still weren't quite sure why or how. Um, <clears throat> then there was um, some interesting work done by Jan Herding, who at the time was a PhD student with, with Felix Bankeberg in Berlin. And they were basically doing these same paradigms also in various uh, sensory modalities, um, but in humans with EEG. And they had very similar uh, observations. So these were our original monkey results. And then Jan found basically these same patterns. He used a little different way of plotting it. He, he plots the time courses. We basically could also use beta power as a readout of the decision outcome. Now, to this point, we weren't quite sure why that would be a beta power modulation, um, but there was quite some compelling evidence that um, we can we can somehow retrieve this, this information content that's being held in memory during the delay from the beta modulation. Um, some years ago, I, I, I wrote this review paper with Bernard Spitzer, who had been working on the, the human um, EG recordings. And we, we propose what well, the role for beta here is, is in activating or reactivating the specific networks that, in, um, that encode the actual uh, information in, in a, a, perhaps in the spike rate code or, or pick your favorite uh, a way of encoding information. And the role of beta is very much the, the giving a burst of synchronization to the particular cells that form such a network. And what we were picking up with our beta power modulation was perhaps uh, sort of a, a fingerprint of that underlying dynamic. And you could imagine if you're recording with single tip electrodes in um, in in the monkey uh, premotor cortex that you might be able to pick up, let's say here, the red cells that are, are, are coding for one outcome versus uh, the blue cells encoding uh, the other decision outcome that based on just sort of the, the the configuration of that network and and the distance of your recording electrode vis a vis those those cells that that turns out or turns up in your data as a power modulation kind of an indirect readout of which which uh, circuits are activated that was sort of our best explanation at the time somehow beta gives us some some readout of these networks that are encoding in in spike activity, the, the information to be held. All right, so then fast forward to um, Eli Rassi joining my lab uh, to work on this question. And now we're we're still looking at monkey data. This is work in collaboration with Ugo Merchand, who is doing a, a type of categorization task, but it has a lot of really uh, neat controls for various uh, aspects that we couldn't fully exclude in, in, in the prior work. So we're now doing time interval categorization. Although I don't want to claim this is about uh, time for, uh, processing per se, we also have a spatial version of this task and find the same results. So I, I'm not talking about uh, time uh, perception per se here. That just happens to be the, the, the stimulus that we use for this task that the animal has to keep in memory. So. <laughs> The, the monkey is presented with a visual stimulus that indicates the start of the interval. The interval lasts a, a certain amount of time, and the second stimulus uh, indicates the end of the interval. And, and the key item that the animal needs to report on here is this interval. So it's interval categorization, and for each um, experimental block, the animal needs to decide for whether the interval presented is uh, a short or long one. Now, what is short and long differs per block. So there were three different conditions. In the first one, this, this range of, of intervals from 200 up to 330 milliseconds is considered long. Everything from 370 up to 500 is long. So in the context of that block, the animal is presented with a certain interval and knows this, these are the two categories here and makes a, a, a motor report indicating whether it's short or long. Now, 
uh, Hugo came up with a very clever way of doing the motor mapping. So during the delay, the animal can make the decision, but doesn't yet know um, what the motor response will be, because that's varied on each trial based on these colored circles that correspond to long or short answers. And then they make a, 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 a joystick movement to indicate their answer. So it gives us sort of a clean decision delay where there's no yet a motor, not yet a motor plan, but we have the, the animal has the decision. Now on different blocks, what is short and long was varied. So on this uh, middle condition here, some of the intervals that were long in the first condition are now short. And then it was also balanced such that some of the intervals that are long here are actually short on yet a third condition. So this really provides a great control for the actual uh, stimulus properties because short and long is only defined in the context of a particular block, but not um, across the entire experiment. So you can counterbalance in your analysis, these trials, for instance, you can compare, let's say 870 milliseconds when it's a long versus short interval, et cetera. All right, so of course our main, main question here was, do we find these beta modulations during the delay window uh, and can we read out uh, the decision from that? So we're now, we've moved away from this um, frequency discrimination the tactile system we're using very different type of, of, of stimuli. Can we still uh, uh, read out the decision? And of course, based on our prior findings, I was interested in seeing these beta power modulations. So the first thing um, I looked at was basically, well, do we get beta at all? So also I should mention here we're recording in the uh, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and also in, in pre-SMA. So the first contrast here is showing that decision delay versus a uh, pre-stimulus window. And the good thing is that we get beta peaks in, in, in all both monkeys in all, all areas that we looked at. Um, as I said, we had previously looked at these beta, beta power modulations. We do see that here in decision versus uh, the baseline window. However, what's very obvious from these spectra is that what we're seeing uh, perhaps much more prominently is this frequency shift uh, with a speeding up of the beta rhythm from, from baseline to decision. Now Yi Zhang, who joined uh, the lab as a data science master student, um, implemented this really neat code to look at beta burst because we were also thinking that perhaps it's not exactly a sustained oscillation that we're observing. It might be this brief burst of uh, um, beta activity. So he basically replicated the findings that uh, Ellie had with sort of a traditional FFT approach. Uh, now looking at beta burst dynamics and similarly, we see this reduction in amplitude, but also clear speeding up of, of the beta rhythm. All right, so that's just basically decision versus, versus um, uh, baseline. So it's more of a task modulation. Of course, the key question is, do we, can we still read out the decision? When we look at both DLPFC and pre-SMA, we indeed find that we can, based on the beta dynamics, predict which answer the animal is going to give. So long versus short interval. However, uh, as I mentioned previously, we've seen these beta power modulations. And while that didn't make a ton of sense, why would be beta power? That's just, well, that was the readout of the signal that we were getting. Now using perhaps somewhat more refined uh, uh, analysis methods, what we're seeing is that what's actually happening is a shift in beta between these two decision outcomes. So for um, trials where the animal decides it's a, it's a long interval, we find a slightly slower beta rhythm. On trials where the animal decides it's a short interval, we find a slightly faster beta rhythm. And again, he replicates this with the burst analysis. Uh, we find this in both areas. And when we look at the incorrect trials, we again see a flip of the pattern, meaning we can predict the animal's decision, not the actual uh, um, physical stimulus properties. And we did all the counterbalancing because we had this nice task design where each or where several of the, the intervals could be long or short, depending which condition we were in. So we can control for all those aspects. 
And we see that we can use beta frequency to read out the decision. And we can also look at that in a time resolve ma manner. So this is uh, the instantaneous frequency for the two decision outcomes, uh, short and long. And you can see that for uh, a good period prior to decision, we see separation of, of beta frequency and sort of ramps up, but in a slightly different uh, ways for the long and short trials. Uh, and again, in both areas, and it flips for the incorrect responses. We then looked at the coherence of uh, beta between uh, DLPFC and pre-SMA. Um, again, replicating these um, um, frequency dynamics. So there's coherence between, or synchronization between DLPFC and pre-SMA uh, in the beta band, and again, specific frequencies uh, for specific decision outcomes. Again, it flips for the incorrect trials. So all of this points to somehow frequency being the relevant uh, uh, feature here of the beta rhythm that allows us to read out the decision outcome. Um, using Granger causality analysis, Ellie determined that this, this shift is likely driven in this case by uh, DLPFC. So there's some DLPFC2 pre-SMA connection here, perhaps some decision uh, being uh, forwarded to be transformed uh, into a motor, uh, motor plan. And importantly, and to me, this was sort of the highlight of, of the whole project, we can then go back to the uh, single unit uh, cells that were recorded from and see how spikes lock to these, these different beta rhythms. Now, what um, Uga had done in, in the original analysis of these data in their lab, they had sorted all the different cells into, the, into um, based on their response to various task aspects. So they have cells that encode in their spike firing rates the decision outcome, and there are cells that are specifically selected for long decision outcomes versus short decision outcomes. So what we did here is take those, basically the, the classification of their cells, and take the long selective cells and the short selective cells and see how they lock to the beta rhythm. And then it turns out that the long selective cells, so in blue, are specifically locked to this slightly slower beta rhythm, whereas the short selective cells in red are selectively locked to the um, faster beta rhythm that we determined uh, uh, <clears throat> can be used as a readout. So it's sort of linking the spike and, uh, and uh, um, uh, LFP results here. We can use beta frequency as a readout for the animal's decision we also know which cells encode which decision in their spike activity, and then see that those selectively lock to the respective rhythms. All right, so as, as I started out, we, we had this, this idea that beta might be important for forming these transient um, ensembles, so flexibly within an area, synchronizing cells that are encoding particular content in a, a specific moment in the task, as I hope I made it clear, we weren't entirely sure why that would be beta power um, uh, uh, being the relevant uh, factor here, which we, we came up with some explanations, but it never made total sense. And I think it's really cool that Ellie took this idea, tested it in this new data set and kind of refined the framework. It's now proposing, no, it's not so much beta power, maybe that was sort of an indirect measure uh, of what's actually happening there. And it would see what it seems to be is these beta frequency specific channels um, that set up uh, the transferring of information about, in our case, a particular decision outcome. Now, we don't think this is exclusive to encoding decision outcomes. That just happens to be the paradigm that we've uh, uh, used here and looked at. We have some indication this also holds for the, the working memory period per se, where you hold uh, um, the stimulus information in memory. But what we're now proposing in this, this refined version of, of the framework is that beta specific beta frequency channels allow for the multiplexing of information. And in our case, the, the blue versus the, 
the, the orange uh, cells here, the blue versus the orange rhythms here, are encoding for these particular decision outcomes. Uh, but we do propose that this might have much broader uh, um, uh, use in the brain. Which brings me to the, the next set of projects. We studied, well, most of this so far in, in, in the monkey, when we wanted to see if we can pick up these same dynamics in human MEG EEG recording. Now, of course, we know we can see beta modulations, um, but can we, well, first off, see this link to, the, to decision outcomes, and more specifically, can we see these uh, frequency shifts? Because they can be quite subtle, right? It's often only a few hertz of difference between these, these beta rhythms, it depends on, on the individual. So can we pick that up in, in extracranial recording? Now, before I get to that, and I might not actually get to the answer of that question today, we had a whole bunch more questions, uh, complicating matters uh, in our human work. For the first being, how do we even identify genuine oscillatory dynamics versus other, um, other dynamics such as one over F shifts or perhaps uh, evoked responses or, or things that look like oscillations but aren't actually. Um, when, when we've assured ourselves that we're looking at oscillations, how do we distinguish different frequency bands? Now, you can think of alpha versus beta, but also how, and that might seem trivial, but if you say you have a 14 hertz rhythm, is this alpha or beta, right? That we need a better way than just uh, uh, looking at a specific um, number in the spectrum to, to separate these rhythms, uh, perhaps based on, on the function they're implementing. But then you get into sort of a circular logic there. So it's not, not all that trivial to really distinguish different bands. And to complicate matters further, um, it seems that perhaps just labeling a band uh, based on, on a range of, of, of uh, well, sort of these canonical uh, bands that we've used in the field for, for about a century might not be the best way to really um, differentiate different dynamics. And it's quite possible that within these bands, there's overlapping rhythms that might either implement very different functions or we're mixing together and at risk especially exists in, in, in extracranial recordings, uh, um, rhythms that originate from different sources or generators. So that's a whole, whole bunch of, of questions we had. Um, that that are not at all trivial to answer. And this is where I go into a little, little uh, intermezzo about alpha. Uh, this, is a, this was a working memory MEG study that uh, Melanie Ria in my uh, lab had, had worked on as a master's student. And she was, uh, well, there were several questions in their project, but she was specifically looking at alpha modulations and just wasn't getting any clear pictures. Now, one of the reasons that alpha is, is always one of our, it's always been one of our favorite rhythms is that no matter what you do, you can always find alpha in, in an EG or MEG recording, and it tends to modulate well with, with most of our tasks. So it was kind of puzzling that we couldn't figure out what was happening in this, this visual spatial working memory task. And Julio uh, joined the lab as a postdoc, and well, actually originally I wanted him to look at beta in this project, but somehow it turned into to an alpha story. And he thought we can use ICA to separate potentially different alpha contributions that when we use our sort of, sort of a standard approach, we're all mixing together and that's why we're not, not seeing what's really happening. So he came up with this pipeline. We were specifically interested in posterior alpha rhythms. So he um, <clears throat> identified all ICA components that originated from the brain. Uh, in this case, had a posterior uh, dipole because that's what, what we we're looking for and had an identifiable alpha peak. So if, if there was just some uh, one over F modulation, but no no peak in the alpha uh, band, uh, the components were very rejected. So that's how we end up with something like 170 components that are all identified as posterior alpha. And then we look at the modulation during this uh, work working memory task. So first standard, like memory delay versus baseline uh, contrast, and then looking at the specific conditions. Now, I don't really want to go into all the details of this particular 
uh, paradigm. I'm showing this more as sort of uh, presenting the, the, the logic here. And what happened in, in Melanie's original analysis, if she just looked at a standard alpha, alpha band, let's say 8 to 14 hertz, uh, average set all that together and contrasted memory uh, delay versus baseline, we weren't seeing any significant modulations, which is somewhat surprising. Then if we refined our analysis a bit and started using individual alpha peak frequencies rather than just blindly averaging over a band that already improved uh, the results a bit and that now we were seeing modulations, but it was still, we weren't getting any condition effects and it's still, the picture is rather blurred. So the point I'm making here is that it was really necessary to separate these different contributions to actually get any sort of clear task modulation. And, and that makes total sense if you look at the, the components that Julio was, was able to um, uh, distinguish here. He ended up finding in, in virtually all participants two different posterior alpha uh, components that were modulated in opposite ways uh, uh, in this task. So if we look at the memory delay versus baseline contrast, there is this component that we labeled alpha one that tends to be a little bit more posterior, maybe originating from visual cortex with a um, slightly lower alpha peak frequency and a different shape of the spectrum. Uh, that component ten increases during the memory delay versus fixation, whereas there's a second set of components that we labeled alpha two here, slightly different spatial spectral uh, properties that actually decreases during memory delay versus baseline. Now, if you didn't separate these components and just you know do your do your standard analysis where this is all uh, blurred together, it makes sense that you're not finding anything because if half the alpha sources are going up, the other half are going down. Of course, when you average them, you end up with nothing. So that's kind of the the main point I want to make here. And once we set made this separation, we also started seeing condition effects. We had destructor versus no destructor conditions. And we saw uh, um, a relation with behavior on the task, so task performance. Again, none of this came out of the analysis uh, without doing this separation. All right, I'm telling this whole story because, as I said, originally I wanted, I wanted to look at beta in this particular data set. The reason we ended up looking with alpha, I don't know, it's partly because we still really like alpha, but also because when you do this, this ICA analysis works super well for finding um, alpha dynamics. It didn't work as well for finding beta components. And some participants, you also are able to extract beta components that doesn't work well across the board. That's probably because alpha is extremely dominant, uh, but there's some, some more issues there. And Julio is always very concerned with harmonics and other uh, uh, potentially uh, fact, factors that can lead to uh, spurious oscillations that we might uh, erroneously be, be labeling as, as genuine oscillatory activity. So we were quite excited to see uh, Natalie's recent uh, perspective on this, which sort of, uh, yeah, was very much in line with our thinking about um, the importance of making sure that when we identify or think we identify oscillatory activity that we do all these checks to make sure um, that it is genuine oscillatory dynamics we're looking at and not a harmonic or introduced by non-sinusoidal properties of lower frequency rhythms. And that's particularly a concern for, for beta. Um, and, and as I mentioned, the, the ICA approach worked super well for alpha, but that didn't really translate to the beta case. So we had to come up with uh, more refined methods, so this paper was was helpful in our thinking there, and sort of also confirming that we might be might be on the right path here. So, so one of the the concerns that we had was that if let's say you have a strong alpha rhythm, which is typically true in many of our recordings, that has non sinusoidal properties that differ between the two conditions, you might be comparing two conditions um, and think you get a difference in beta modulation, but it's actually all driven by this, this underlying um, alpha rhythm. Another concern Julio had, because we wanted to follow up on the, the beta burst results we had from the monkey study, is that you might find 
in in a typical spectral analysis, um, amplitude changes in beta, but that are actually much more uh, are, could be better explained by changes in in beta bursts. So in in this particular case, you might have a change in burst rate, so more of these these burst uh, episodes or the duration of, uh, so the number of cycles in, in a burst, uh, rather than actual power or amplitude changes. So we thought combining all of this, maybe the way to go is to do a beta burst analysis, identify all, all burst episodes, but then checking for the potential influence of these non-sinusoidal oscillations at lower frequencies. And again, that's specifically for, for the beta uh, approach. So Julio set up this new, pipeline. Now we're looking at uh, another working memory task, uh, EEG data. And well, for all the, all the details of the analysis, I'll refer you to the paper, but the, the logic is we first remove the 1 over F uh, uh, contribution to the spectrum, then identify any sort of uh, beta activity, and then do a very strict uh, selection of those beta burst events and basically throw out all the ones that have uh, an alpha or other lower frequency peak or, or burst event that is stronger uh, or that's prominent and only keep the beta events that are prominent and not uh, co-occurring with, with a big lower frequency burst. This, as you might imagine, greatly reduces uh, the data. So this, this, this analysis was sort of twofold. Of course, we wanted to see the beta um, modulation in the context of our of our spatial working memory task. But primarily, we wanted to show if we do the super strict selection and only keep beta events that we think we truly believe are genuine beta and not caused by a lower frequency oscillation and and showing up as harmonics. Is there anything left? And if you look at the, the prior literature on beta modulation in, in the context of working memory, uh, it's kind of all over the place. And we thought maybe part of, of the confusing results previously is because a lot of that is mixing in these, let's say, alpha, alpha dynamics that are interpreted as beta. So we thought if we do the super strict selection and we still find something that might... Uh, well, that's sort of step one in then continuing our our um, work on on the uh, beta frequency shift framework. All right, so we then detect these beta burst events and describe them in terms of their peak frequency, um, their amplitude, so that's sort of similar uh, to power, then the burst rate and the burst duration. And this is where I always get confused, but the burst rate is the number of bursts, or the number of these bursts, uh, uh, epochs, and then the burst duration is the number of cycles in each each burst event. Um, I'll, I'll say a bit about the task as well here. So this is a spatial working memory task uh, where the participant is presented with this bar that has a particular uh, orientation, has to remember uh, that for a work, three second working memory delay, then gets an instruction that is either a stay or switch queue. Uh, in the stay queue, they just have to keep remembering that original angle. In the switch one, they have to uh, flip it um, to the uh, orthogonal direction and keep that in memory and then report that uh, with a, a button press. On every trial, this response mapping is, is randomized so that during this delay, they can only keep in mind their decision, not yet prepare. Uh, the motor responds, then we also have a load manipulation where the participant either keeps one or three orientations in memory at a time. And again, uh, the, the, the key motivation here was showing that there's any beta, beta dynamics left after the super strict like uh, uh, selection of, of beta burst events. The task worked in the sense that uh, participants uh, have lower accuracy and slower responses on the higher load condition. And within the higher load condition, there's also a difference between, between stay and switch, and that switch is harder than stay. This, this all makes 
should make sense and, and is as predicted. So we have a working memory task with a load manipulation and this instruction queue. And then these two windows where we can look at, at beta modulation. So uh, Julio extracted all these, these uh, burst events and then asked, do we see any sort of modulation by the task? So this is the sort of standard uh, memory delay versus fixation contrast. We were very glad that after all this great reduction of the data, we still see modulation of beta burst events such that we see a reduction in amplitude uh, during the delay. The, the duration of the burst uh, events becomes shorter and we see an increase in the uh, peak frequency. And we can look at the, the burst waveforms to, to verify that it's truly a beta uh, event. I don't think I included the figure, but he then also did a control analysis on all the alpha events. If you look at the waveforms, there is a very distinct alpha oscillation. So we're quite convinced that with all these, these controls, we were able to, to isolate genuine beta events that are not contaminated by any sort of, of alpha or other lower frequency activity. Uh, then we looked at the memory load events, so contrasting the load one versus load three condition. Again, we see this pattern of reduced amplitude and duration, an increase of frequency, and you know, also an increase of burst rate with the higher, um, uh, higher load condition versus the lower load condition. And then there's uh, additionally a um, effect of this, this task, uh, Q state versus switch in the same direction, a decrease of amplitude and duration, increase of frequency and rate. Again, I want to highlight, we really threw out a lot of the data. So the fact that we're seeing task modulations and these condition modulations is not exactly, exactly trivial. So it's really making the point that there is uh, genuine beta oscillations that we can detect in human EEG uh, um, or, or MEG data, and that these are uh, modulated by task conditions. Which brings me back to that, that the, the, the 2.0 version of our beta framework. Um, we, we believe that this, this all fits this idea of having a, a mechanism to set up these beta frequency channels that um, that form these ensembles of cells that are encoding, whether it's for decision A versus decision B, or, or maintaining a um, certain representation in memory that then they later needs to be uh, modulated. But again, for the human work, we first wanted to convince ourselves that we can identify these, these beta events in the first place. Just a, a brief outlook of where we're taking this next, sort of in two directions. One is, so far we've been looking at this in the context of what some might consider fairly basic tasks. Um, we typically use in, in, in the lab, but today I show these, these, these various uh, discrimination tasks or spatial working memory tasks. We also tend to use spatial attention tasks or fairly uh, basic perceptual tasks, uh, which we think is, well, that's complex enough to look at these dynamics. But of course, at the outset, I said we think these, these low-level operations can then be recruited to subserve higher-level cognitive processes. And if these are general mechanisms, that should hold across the board. So with um, Joanna Zioga, uh, who is a postdoc in my lab and also in Andrea Martin's lab, we're taking this to a whole different set of tasks and looking in uh, at, at the same dynamics in the context of, of language processing, language comprehension. This is work in, in, in preparation currently. Here we had participants listen to a sentence in which they had to detect a particular word that, that indicated a, a specific category of which they then, after a delay, had to report another exemplar of that category or a feature. Um, <clears throat> and they had to uh, uh, speak their answer. So it's a very different type of task, different type of, of motor output. And as a first question, we were wondering, do we see beta dynamics uh, that allow us to, in this case, 
distinguish these different task rules. So subject got acute instruction, whether they were in the exemplar or feature condition. And Yana shows looking at the beta time courses that we can separate these two conditions. Again, in, in well, for my son, there's way more high level tasks than, than what we're used to, to looking at. So that's one direction we're taking that in. Uh, another another project that Joanna did with, with Andrea Martin it was uh, participants listening to to naturalistic stories. Uh, this is spoken uh, language, and then she did a uh, uh, she analyzed the processing of of low versus high level syntactic features. I, I don't want to go into all the details of it here, but the key point I want to make is that we can use. We can use the beta signal here uh, to pre or to get a readout again of these different processes. And I don't want to jump ahead and claim that this is exactly the same as what we were observing in the monkey where we're doing category A versus B. That might be a bit of a stretch, but I think it is step one in showing that we can track different networks becoming active uh, that encode for for different, in this case, uh, uh, syntactic structure, uh, higher level features. So to me, that's promising in that we can um, translate these findings in from fa fairly basic, more perceptual um, tasks and see similar, potentially similar dynamics in, in here in the context of, of, of language comprehension. Now on the other end of the scale, we're now, um, Doing this, uh, uh, doing as a project in in mice where we're using a version, a simplified version of our spatial. Uh, uh, oh, did we lose the? Beautiful. Um, where where we're using a simplified version of the of the uh, spatial working memory task. Now between monkeys and humans, you can there's there's quite some tasks that you can use in both species. With mice, that becomes a little more tricky. So we had to, to, to uh, come up with a simpler version of that task. But uh, Ines, who's a postdoc in my lab, um, and in collaboration with Alex Harris, one of our colleagues at Columbia, came up with this uh, uh, paradigm that mice are able to do where they hear an auditory cue uh, and after a brief delay, have to either go left or right in the team A. So they learn this association between the auditory cue and the direction. So it's sort of our, our mouse equivalent of the spatial working memory task. And, and the entire reason we're doing this in rodents is so we can use optogenetics and go to um, use, use neuromodulation to really probe all these mechanisms that we uh, uh, propose our, our play here because, well, as excited as I am about all the results I showed you today, in the end, these are all based on correlations, right? And that's very helpful, I think, for coming up with, with, with a framework, but ultimately we want to show a causal relation here. And, and that's why we're doing this in a mouse model where we're hoping to perturb these beta dynamics. So step one was getting these mice to do a spatial working memory task. Uh, Inez is now about to implant these mice so we can do uh, LFP and spike recordings in, in the prefrontal cortex where we have observed in, in, in the primate model beta uh, dynamics and, and our colleagues at Columbia have previously in the team ACE task shown beta dynamics there as well. So there's a good chance that, we're, that, that we'll find uh, a oscillatory mechanism there or a solitary dynamic there that's fairly similar to what we're observing in in the primate case. And then the next step will be perturbing those rhythms. And I think that will be really key to take this to sort of the next level. Um, and the, the goal is to show that if we are able to perturb beta in prefrontal cortex during working memory retention, that we can impair the animal's behavior on doing the task. Because if beta is key for um, forming these uh, uh, communication channels and setting up these flexible networks and perturbing that signal should lead to uh, impaired performance. So that's very much ongoing work. 
and I just wanted to give sort of an overview of where we're taking this in the lab. And with that, I would like to end. Uh, all the credit for the work goes to to my to my lab. It's a great pleasure and honor working with such a fun, uh, smart, and talented team. Uh, so it's very exciting to see what they come up with. Sometimes they take things in slightly different directions uh, than I originally intended, but I think that only yeah helps to 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 improve the work and and refine the framework. Also, Ugo Mershan has been a great colleague to work with on the. Um, the monkey work, and we're now preparing parallel experiments. We're repeating the exact same task in monkeys and, and humans to make sure we're really talking about the same dynamics in both. And thank you for your attention.